God add a rich blessing to the reading of his holy, infallible, inspired, and inerrant word. And one of the features of Psalm 57, which is fairly t- easy to recognize, is its structure. And I'm sure you picked up on that as we read through our text, and I sought to put the right emphasis upon the things that we're reading, because as you come into verse 5 and 11, it's fairly evident that the psalmist is repeating himself. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. So we have what's called a refrain, and basically it breaks the psalm into two equal sections, verses 1 through 4, refrain, verse 5, verses 6 through 10, refrain, verse 11. Commentators have long noted this structure. Calvin himself says about it. In the first section, David gives expression to the anxiety which he felt, imploring divine assistance against Saul and his other enemies. And in the second, he proceeds upon the confident expectation of deliverance and stirs up his soul to the exercise of praise. So if we could boil Calvin's comments down about the structure of the psalm, roughly he says the first four verses correspond to anxiety and praise corresponds to the substance of sections 6 through 10. That seems fair enough to sum up the substance and the content of the psalm, but but there's another way to use structure to, to get a sense of what's at the heart of Psalm 57. And that word's trouble. That word is trouble because uh, the very first motion in Psalm 57 verses 1 through 4 moves from God to trouble. Notice as he seeks to cry out to God in verse 1. And he amplifies the sense of his trouble by referencing lions in verse 4. And then the second motion moves from verses 6 through 10 from trouble To God, as he references those who have dug pits and cast nets. And the psalm ends, of course, with an appeal to God. So what is at the heart of Psalm 57 structurally? It's trouble. It moves to trouble and it moves away from trouble. Trouble is at the center. And so the issue then, as we deal with this psalm and expound it, is to see what does David do with his trouble? What does David do with his trouble? And that's why we've entitled this psalm, Exercising Faith in the Eye of the Storm. Exercising Faith in the Eye of the Storm, because that is precisely what David does by way of response to the trouble that he encounters. And so we're going to, first of all, notice faith challenged. Faith challenged. Now, I'm going to pick our way through these first uh, handful of verses and selectively sort of highlight for you some of the challenge of faith. So we get a sense and a flavor of the opposition which David is up against here and what leads him to his faith response. And, And the first thing that I think we can say about David's faith being challenged is located in verse 1 and in that word calamities. I don't know which translation you're using this morning. Some of you may have destruction. Some of you may have devastation. Another quite literal way to translate the Hebrew here is an engulfing ruin. Sometimes it's associated with the devastation in the wake of of heavy winds and storm. But, But I'm okay with the idea of calamities in the sense is that's what we would describe the end result of all of that as. Calamity. He is in the midst of calamity. As you move on into verse 3, you see taunting. Notice here he says, He shall sin from heaven and save me from the reproach of those who would swallow me up. And so we notice here the verbal nature of the challenge to face, that there are those who are in opposition to David who are reproaching him. That, mean, that word means to discredit and to defy and to insult and, and to mock. And the intensity of the verbal opposition is indicated on the verb that follows it up because David doesn't just say they reproach him. It says the reproach of him that, notice the aim here signaled, 
they reproach him that they may do what? Swallow him. And it comes from the world of animal predators. Literally, it means for a wild animal to chase down his prey and to consume it. So the purpose of the verbal taunting is to destroy David. It's character assassination. We'll come back to that more in just a moment. There's another element here which signals the challenge to faith, and it is referenced in verse 4 in the outset where it says, My soul is among lions. My soul is among lions. And I think we would all agree there's perhaps nothing more terrifying in all of nature besides terrible, awful, poisonous snakes than lions. Because they are fierce, because they are ruthless, because they are powerful, because they are speedy, and they chase prey for one reason, and that's to shred it, to kill it, and to consume it. And so this is, a, is an index and a, an opening into the violence and the ferocity of David's opponents. But as we keep reading into verse 4, we'll notice we come back to uh, the theme of uh, of a verbal attack and a verbal challenge to faith, and this time it's defamation. He says, I lie even among those that are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. The New American has, I think, a very good translation here. It says, I lie among those who breathe for fire, which has the sense of, of devouring and consuming something with flames like a mythological dragon feature. That's what the sense is here, and, and the verbal nature of the attack and the ferocity and the violence and the destructive nature is highlighted by teeth that are likened to spears and arrows and a tongue that's as sharp as a sword. All of this language and imagery building on verse 3, but the entire point of it is shame. The entire point of the verbal attack and the challenge of faith is shame. And if you think about it, this is one of the most painful kind of troubles you can endure because once your name is ruined by a campaign of smears and lies, it's difficult to ever recover. Even if it is shown in the aftermath that you are innocent of every charge brought against you, there's still no way for people to look at you without the memory and the recollection of all the tawdry, corrupt, vile, evil smears. And so one of the most devastating ways to ruin a person's life is to make up vile, evil lies about them and then to disperse them far and wide publicly in such a way that they feel like they stick to that person. So defamation, character assassination, shame, humiliation, public ruin. There's another aspect to this challenge of faith, and I call it dirty tricks. Look at verse 6. Dirty tricks. They have prepared a net for my steps, and my soul is bowed down, and they have digged a pit for me. So we're back to the predatory kind of language, and here we have the language of the hunt and of hunters preparing a net to, to tangle up the prey and to dig holes and camouflage them. So the prey would step into what seems to be firm ground only to fall into a pit and to break their neck and to die. But the, the indicator of the, of the violence, obviously, is, is how they do it. They're, they're doing it with trickery and deceit and obviously with a violent aim. And so what David is speaking of here is predatory individuals or rather a campaign of opponents who seek to use treachery and violence to take his life. A final element of the opposition is what I might call psychological operations. Psych ops. I want you to notice the description that David provides of himself in the middle of verse 6, where he says, My soul is bowed down. 
so is bowed down. And it, it's built, the language here is built on a literal posture of when you've seen somebody in grief who, who's heard the most horrible news is, is they, they crank their neck over and they bend and perhaps even if they're standing, put their hands on their knees and grieve. It's a, it's a posture, it's a visual image which speaks of unspeakable pain. This is an emotional response. This is a psychological indicator of distress. And so this is what David is saying about himself. This is the affect. This is what the campaign of smears and lies and violence and calamities has produced within his heart. He's in psychological and emotional and spiritual agony. He says it caused his soul to, to bow. Well, I think this is so important to notice, people of God, because um, one thing we should never tire of reminding ourselves of is, uh, as Calvin said, the, the Psalms teach us how to feel. The Psalms teach us how to feel, and one of the things that makes the Psalms so readable is that almost any day of the week, at any point of the day, you can pick up the Psalm and start reading and begin to identify. Whether it's joy, whether it's fear, whether it's sorrow, whether it's praise, whether it's gratitude, whether it's lament. They speak a universal spiritual language. David shows us something that I think is very important for even believers to take note of and to remind themselves of is that we are not called to be stoics. That when the pains and sorrows and tribulations and afflictions and sorrows of life come upon us, we do not have to clench our teeth and present a stiff upper lip and shrug our shoulders and simply say, well, we just take the good with the bad. I don't know how often I encounter believers who seem to approach life that way and at least verbally express to me that's how they're processing their trouble as if it would be unholy or offensive to God somehow that they acknowledge that their soul is bowed down. Remind us this morning, people of God, that something that is holy and right to do before God is, is to bring all of your sorrow and, and heart pain before him and express it with the most transparency and openness and honesty as David does as he says my soul is bowed down my soul is bowed down and overwhelmed by challenges to faith you see when we do that we've placed ourselves in the right posture to come before the Lord in faith to remind ourselves what we really are, and that's beggars. We come to God with nothing but our faith, and we ask for Him to change our life by His grace. I said I'd mention this before I go on. I just want us to note the historical context, and it's set to the tune of Do Not Destroy, which is interesting. It is a mictom, and I have no idea what that means, and so does no other scholar, so it's okay. There is something that it feels like it may be relevant. It says, when he fled from Saul into the cave, and there's a couple of historical incidents and examples from 1 Samuel 22, in uh, the cave of Agilom in 1 Samuel 24 in the cave of En Gedi. But as you look at those and you compare the historical context to what we have here, they don't seem to, to match up quite like they, they might. So another way to think of this is this is another one of those unknown, non-documented or recorded incidents in that space of 
of what at least what seems to me a year and a half to two, maybe a little bit more years of David fleeing for his life and going from one cave to the next in the Palestinian hillsides to, to keep his life. A season of humiliations before he takes on the kingship. And what he's talking about here is trouble. He's in the eye of the storm. There are calamities, there are mockings, there are fierce lions, there's defamation, there's dirty tricks, there's psychological operations. And David is worn down. That brings us now to David's response in the eye of the storm. And we notice faith exercised. And I want us to see here the relationship of ideas as we begin to, to take up this point because Psalm 57 begins on what we might say is a very sweeping note of exultation, a very vibrant and powerful note of, of plea and, and so forth. As he says, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. And that has to be read against the backdrop of the woes and calamities and the eye of the storm, which I've just pointed out for us. It's a very important reminder of how to read the Psalms is to realize there's a story embedded within them. It's important to get your finger on the pulse of that story and realize that we're not reading in sequence here. This is not a linear unfolding of ideas often in the Psalms. What you have is, is the heart of the story and the original the origination of the narrative embedded with the psalm sometimes is in the way interior part of the psalm. But all of what I have described here is what David responds to or what David is dealing with. But I want you to see the sequence of ideas here as he says, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of of thy wings, I will make my refuge until the calamities are overpassed. Even here, we don't have a, a linear sequence and unfolding of the ideas because it's very obvious to us from the grammatical structure when he says, be merciful, be merciful for David is saying the basis of his appeal to God for his mercy is founded upon something prior. And that prior thing is David's Soul trust in God. As he says, my soul trusteth. It's a perfect tense verse which tells us this is a prior act. And the prior act is of David in the midst of his agonies and the eye of the storm has taken himself to God in faith. And he's found refuge here, as he says, under the shadow of God's wing. And that tells us something that's highly important to the response that David makes here is because as he stands in the eye of the storm, he takes himself in faith to God as a refuge. And here, as he, as he senses, he's firmly planted under the shadow of God's wings. He now prays. And the thing that he senses is this. That God is a God of mercy. This almost feels like a moment of faith renewal because as he takes his faith and, and he runs to the wings of the Lord as a refuge, there is something that is deeply impressed upon his soul. And that thing is the mercy of God. And so he cries out with double emphasis and repetition, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. And remember now what mercy is, biblically speaking. Very important that we understand it according to the mind of God and according to scriptures, because what mercy is, is a divine determination to show compassion to the helpless. Mercy is a, is a divine determination to show compassion to those who are in need and don't deserve help. It's an exercise of God's pity to those who are destitute. And so the point of it here is to say, as he's come unto the shadow of his wings and the exercise of faith, 
even though he is deeply aware of his personal unworthiness and his sinfulness and his brokenness, the thing that he seems to be impressed with is that God will show mercy. The thing that he desires is that exercise of divine mercy. And then as he moves forward in this psalm, he unfolds what that mercy would look like and why it would be exercised towards him. And that's going to be expressed in a series of convictions. We have this initial impulse here. Praise, be merciful unto me. Be merciful unto me. But now we begin to see what undergirds those powerful, terse prayer requests. And the first one is his conviction about God. Look at verse 2. I will cry out to God most high. Notice the first, the first conviction of faith which, which empowers and lifts his prayer is, is the character of God. He cries out unto God most high. And what we have here is a Hebrew title for the Lord, El Yon. And it, it is a title which emphasizes and highlights the, the sovereignty and the power of God extending over all of life. And see what is at the root of his conviction as he prays is his conviction about the character and the nature of God, that he is supreme over all things. And though he may be surrounded by the violence of creatures and the violence of creation, the thing that his heart and his mind and his faith is persuaded of, that God is not creature, he is creator. He is sovereign over all. And so he appeals to the Lord God most high. And then notice how the thought continues to unfold in verse 2. Unto God that performeth all things for me. Performeth all things for me. And there's two elements to this faith conviction. And the first is that God has a plan. And that God executes it. Imagine as we hear that language, our, our minds move forward in Scripture to Romans 8.28 where uh, Paul uh, strikes that, that sonorous, powerful, exaltationary note when he says, all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to His purpose. It's a heart of... It's a verse that's full of the, the heart of Christian comfort for us, which begins, first of all, in the idea and with the notion of the theological conviction that God has a plan. That's what purpose means there. That's what purpose means as Paul speaks of, of the purpose. He, he works everything according to the purpose of God, the plan of God, and that tells us that the events of life, no matter how random and chaotic and out of control they feel to us, There's no accidents. Every single event occurs at the plan and the purpose and the, the decree of God. And there's not anything, not even the sparrow, as Jesus says, falling from the sky. The very hairs of the head are numbered. God's decree is comprehensive. And so nothing is happening by chance, even the attack of David's enemies. They're all according to the plan and the purpose of God. And so that's one of the convictions of a believer that sometimes is difficult for us to wrestle with. Sometimes it presents to us a challenge of faith because as we look upon the trouble of our life, as awful as it may be, we may sit there and say, what purpose could possibly be in this? That's a real challenge to faith, isn't it? But as we center ourselves in Christ and the knowledge of God's mercies, one of the things we become persuaded of is that God is good. And so even the hard stuff in our life is according to his perfect plan. 
God has a will and a determination to glorify himself in us. So the comfort begins with knowing that there's a plan and the comfort moves forward and the wings of faith lift with the knowledge that God performs it. Notice how David puts that here. God will perform all things for me. So it's not just that God has a plan, but that God works everything together for good. He works in the midst of the most difficult and painful and awful circumstances, Paul says, to make sure that it turns out for good. At the heart of the Christian faith, we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And the Heidelberg Catechism has a question and answer which expounds what it is for the believer to confess that they believe in God, the Father Almighty, and the maker of heaven and earth. And, and in the middle of that question, it says, not only does God take every evil thing that comes upon us in this veil of tears that he is sovereign over it all, but it says that he will turn it to our good and the basis for confessing that is for he is able to do it being almighty God, El Yom, but also because he is a faithful father. God, for the sake of Christ, has adopted us into his family by grace, and he is our father. And so the heart's conviction is that not only does God have a plan, but God is going to work everything out for good for us according to that plan so that he will be glorified. Faith's conviction is that God performs his plans for his people Moving on to verse 3, we see another uh, aspect to this faith conviction which animates David's prayers. And basically, it's, uh, it's the sense that God can yet do miracles. God can yet do miracles. And I, I, I find that bound up in the opening phrase of verse 3. He shall send from heaven. He shall send from heaven. It's a way of contextualizing his problems and seeing them in the broader scope of the universe, as it were. The broader scope of the cosmos. And yes, his feet are planted firmly on the earth. And he is surrounded by creatures and creation, but God is in the heavens above. And that the supremacy and the sovereignty and the might of the God of heavens is far more vast and superior than what's down below here in his creation. And so to appeal to the heavens and to be confident that God will hear and answer from the heavens is to come to an important realization, which is that God has a way of working things out that's far beyond the scope of our strength or wisdom or understanding. It's so important for us to remember, people of God, is that sometimes the problem that we have is when we find ourselves in the hole of life, we keep digging. We keep trying to fix. We keep trying to fidget and to work on things. And what David realizes is he needs to stop digging and cry out to God to exercise his power from the heavens and change things here on earth by the strength of his hand. The final comfort and consolation of faith is located at the end of verse 3 here. As David goes on to say, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. It's full of confidence in the very way he says it, but there's at the heart of this expression something that is very important to us as believers, and that's that word mercy. You may have a translation this morning that says loving kindness. It's the Hebrew word chesed, which is at the heart of God's covenant revelation of himself. It is that principle by which he binds himself to his people to fulfill all the promises that he makes to his people. And so we find this word loving kindness translated 
across the Old Testament hundreds of times, speaking of the divine determination to fulfill his will and duty to his people. And so David, as a covenant servant of God, reminds himself who he is and who God is and what relationship he is in. He is in covenant with God. And so he assures himself God will exercise loving kindness. And so just think of this faith expressed people of God. He's in the midst of the eye of the storm, surrounded by calamities, barbarous words, treacherous people, violent men, deceivers, people who would seek to cause his soul to go into shock. And in the midst of that, he takes himself in the eye of the storm to the refuge which is under the wings of God, and he appeals to him in faith, crying out to his sovereignty and his supremacy and to the God most high. And he says unto him, I know you have a plan. You will work all things for me. Send forth from heaven. You are a God of mercy and truth. That's faith exercise. Now notice faith exalting. And I want you to look down with me now at verse 7. Where the psalmist cries out, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Does something jump out to you? It feels all of a sudden that we're in calm waters like, like David has found some place of solace and peace and, and refuge we're, we're beyond what is frantic and chaotic it feels like the eye of the storm has passed and so what we have here is, a, is an exchange of, of um, jubilance for turmoil and David starts to speak about himself and what he's going to do in response to God, he says, my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. It's as if as he has come to the Lord in prayer in the midst of his calamities and he's found safe harbor. He is now experiencing harbor for his soul. And it reminds us what you already know and have experienced about prayer in your own life. And it can be so often the case that we find ourselves so embroiled and enmeshed in our trouble, our hearts so weighed down, our minds racing with so many thoughts, our hearts so full of agony and sorrow. And then all of a sudden when we think everything is absolutely hopeless and we've tried everything we do, we say, well, I, I guess we can just pray. And then as we get down into our knees and pray and start exalting God and, and crying out to him as our creator and as our maker and our redeemer and our father in heaven and our sovereign God, what is it that we all of a sudden begin to experience? But a wonderful calm and a composure begins to grip us. We are mindful that there are heavenly solutions to our earthly problems. God can be trusted, that our life is safe in his hands. And so often we move from that prayer of lamentation and concern to praise. And so David says, my heart is fixed, my heart is fixed. And he speaks of early praise. In verse 8, he says, awake my glory, awake my psaltery, awake the harp. I wake myself in the morning and now we're just full of exuberance and energy. He's waking up before the dawn to greet the sunrise with music. And moves from there to international praise in verse 9. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing to thee among the nations. So David moves from his prayer closet or his prayer walk, as it were, to stand upon the rooftops and the mountaintops and to proclaim before the world that God is worthy of praise and exaltation. And so we say, well, what happened? What has changed David's mood? What has changed the, the course and the shape and the direction of the psalm? And it seems to be 
the answer which is uh, expressed or indicated in the, in the sequence of ideas. Notice in verse 8, he says, awake. In verse 9, he says, I will praise. And then verse 10 begins, for. That is an explanation, what it's signaling to us that David is about to recount the basis upon which he has this change of mood and experience and, and shift now towards exaltation as he says, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Why is it that David now is extolling the mercy of God which stacks up to the heavens and the truth of God which is, which is stamped across the skies? And one answer seems to be that it looks like God has begun to work and David can see that because as you look into verse 6 and you see the statement of woes there, after he talks about the soul being weighed down, he says that they have digged a pit before me and into the midst whereof they themselves have fallen. It seems as if David is beginning to notice that the Lord is starting to work, that the treachery that the evil sought to bring upon him has come upon their heads, at least in part, and at least for a moment. But then the psalm ends in a way that may confuse us because David begins to engage yet again in a prayer for God to act as he says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, let thy glory be above the earth. Here's our refrain again. This is what structures the psalm and the unfolding of its content. But you see, this uh, refrain is really a call for God to act. As, as Calvin points out, he says, the psalm concludes with a prayer that God would arise and let not his glory be obscured. And so that tells us something that's important, and it's this. He's still in the eye of the storm. His soul has a spiritual sense of being in safe harbor and refuge. But the totality of his circumstances and his situation hasn't changed. And so that's what's so interesting about the final thing we notice here is that faith is exalting. Faith has been challenged. Faith has been exercised. And now faith is exalting. And the exaltation is if he is rejoicing as if the victory has been accomplished and is in hand. And so he's broken out the harp and the psaltery and he's greeting the dawn and he's proclaiming God's praise before the nations. And he's doing that before he's received the final answer to his prayers. I got to thinking about that and I have become impressed with the idea that this is what our life often is like. This feels to me very consistent with the experience of the believer. That we live in between the gap, between the prayer answer, answered and the reality arrived. We live very often in the gap between the prayer offered and the answer arrived. You have an illness that you pray over that doesn't resolve. You have a financial hardship that takes weeks or months or even more to improve. You have a relationship that is in disrepair and ruin. And yet you've prayed. And because you've prayed and because you know who God is and because you trust as David does that God is a precisely the God who he says he is, this God whose mercy is great into the heavens and his truth is unto the crowds. The clouds, what is David saying? 
is that faith's response in the eye of the storm isn't just that it's an awareness of being challenged. It's not just that it's exercised, but here he has prayed and he's given it all over to God and he reminds himself of what is central and important about God is that he doesn't leave us or forsake us, that he is El Yom, the God most high, that he is the one who lives and reigns in the heavens and he sends forth answers from above and that he is a God of mercy and unfailing love. And so faith folds its hand in the lap and it rests confidently because we know that when we have engaged God in the problems of our life, the resolution will follow. It will just be in his time. And so that's what it is to exercise faith in the eye of the storm. It is reminding ourselves of this great God whom we serve, who loves us and assures us that our life is safe in his hand. Father, we thank you for a text this morning which is relevant to our very life, written hundreds and thousands of years ago, is as up to date as this morning because our life is often so full of despair and calamity and pain and sorrow and affliction. And yet we know what's more true than our sufferings, which is that you are our God and that you are gracious gracious, and that your mercy overflows. So help us then, O Lord, to take faith, whatever faith we have, and run to the wings of your holy refuge and find our safe harbor and hope there, knowing that you are our God and that you do hear and answer our prayers according to your good and perfect will, according to your purpose, in order that you may receive maximum glory. This is our faith. Make it stronger, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.